everybody, Jason Burmis here, and today I am joined by Robbie Martin of MediaRoots.org, I believe? Yeah. Yes, and uh, that's you and your sister, Abby Martin. You've actually been at this well over a decade, I'd say almost 15 years, correct? Pretty much. I mean, Abby's been at it longer than me doing activism, but yeah, we've, we've had our podcast, Media Roots Radio, since um, 2010. Yeah, and... You know, Robbie's done a lot of great work out there. He comes from more of a, I would say, left-wing perspective. We certainly have our differences, um, but we've reached out to one another in the past. We both respect each other's work, and uh, both of us are for more speech, uh, more communication, and more talking to one another rather than uh, what we see in the mainstream where there's a constant divide between the quote-unquote right and left. And I've never really seen myself a part of either. I'm a constitutionalist. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm not an anarchist. I know, you know, my partner over there, Luke Rudowski, he leans uh, that way a lot more than I do. But hey, different strokes for different folks. And I think that, again, more speech is better. So, you know, the real reason I wanted to get you on, uh, Robbie, is I was out of town yesterday. Uh, I was actually out with my family. And uh, I'm getting text messages, messages, and it was your DM uh, that let me know that Alex Jones had been officially banned from YouTube. Now, there were rumblings over the weekend. Uh, you know, he wasn't able to live stream about a week before because of uh, this Robert Mueller rant that he had gone on. Facebook uh, had limited him. And on top of that, it, it looked like he was going to make a comeback, but iTunes took off, I think, four of his podcasts. By Monday, that all changed, and they completely wiped him from the platform. Now, certainly I would say that you probably have uh, a few more differences politically uh, with Jones than even I do, but I've been quick to call out when I do not agree with what InfoWars or Alex is talking about, especially regarding the Trump administration. I think that's a, a key thing to have dissident voices that aren't leaning to one side or another. Uh, and I would say that some of the things he said in the past, you know, throughout his career, let's be honest, have been disingenuous and completely wrong. However, he should still have a platform, uh, but many on the left don't see it that way, Robbie. What's your take on this whole situation? I mean, it's it's complicated, Jason, because, I mean, even, even Alex Jones has described himself this way, and I'm sure you've heard him describe himself this way, is that he's sort of the canary in the coal mine, um, sort of this, you know, this info warrior who has amassed pretty much kind of an independent media empire, so to speak, um, to really come out and be the tip of the spear of a lot of this sort of conspiracy, and more, and now more than ever, more right-leaning conspiracy-friendly uh, media stuff. And, you know, I've grappled with Alex Jones's drift towards being a more partisan right-winger um, over the past, you know, six or seven years. I mean, pretty much the Obama administration was a big change for him, um, drifting more and more towards the right instead of that big tent approach that he kind of started with originally, where he was kind of, you know, the left and right paradigm. You know, it was all about how both parties, both political ideologies were wrong. Um, he drifted more towards the right wing, uh, I don't know, you know, during the Obama administration, but he also started to promote figures like Ted Cruz and Sarah Palin and sort of trying to portray them as heroic even before Trump got in office. And that's, you know, that was around the time when I'm just like, I can't listen to him anymore. He's he's really sort of abandoning um, the original premise of his broadcast, even though when I originally listened to him, um, there were things that I knew were blatantly untrue that he was saying. But at the same time, there were a lot of true things that he was saying that he was very ahead of the curve on, including things like um, the militarized police state, um, which is something I'm sure that you are also concerned about. Um, and then, of course, that was something that he also abandoned um, during the Trump era um, because, you know, I, let's face it, I, I think it had something to do with the Black Lives Matter movement is why he sort of put the militarized police stuff on, on, in the back burner because it wasn't as popular for his audience. Um, but the main issue that I wanted to talk about today with you is that, that um, there has been this push since the 2016 presidential election for corporations joining together with members of government to fight this so-called scourge of fake news. Um, and if you remember, right around when Trump won, 
um, it was there wasn't really any talk uh, that Russia got him elected. Like I'm talking about the months after he won, like you know January, December, um, late November. The talk in the mainstream media was about this problem of fake news and how they thought that fake news might have helped Trump win the election. And it didn't have anything to do with Russia at that time, but that was the narrative being pushed. And, you know, of course, the Russia hysteria stuff started to ramp up again. But what we saw was sort of all these rumblings behind the scenes of companies like Facebook, Google, Apple, uh, these different social media companies actually meeting with government officials and agreeing to, with government officials, sitting senators, congressmen, um, people from the U.S. State Department or from the Obama administration, even before Trump got in, to combat fake news. Now, what does that actually mean? That the there's now an extra layer of terms of service or censorship being imposed on these platforms to determine what is fake news and what isn't fake news. Um, so that you know was a very troubling precedent. But it sort of remained in the background. It wasn't something that people were paying too much attention to um, until, I, and I only a very few people on the left are paying attention to this. I see people like Michael Tracy and Glenn Greenwald talking about this, um, but that's about it. But this idea that Alex Jones being purged sort of in this short period of time from these social media networks actually has something more to do with this um, Silicon Valley government collaboration to combat fake news than it does with Alex Jones technically violating the terms of service of these social media platforms, which is what they're trying to say now. A lot of people from the left are, you know, I'm going back and forth with them now on Twitter sort of saying, well, he did violate the terms of service and that's why he was purged. So that becomes kind of a problematic argument because I, in some ways I do believe Alex Jones has been violating the terms of service, but at the same time, I don't believe that's why he was purged. Because as you know, Jason, there's thousands of people who are also violating those terms of service who still have their content on there. So I don't think that that's actually the issue. I think that there's a greater issue here that needs to be discussed about what is this climate and what have we allowed to happen by buying into these social media networks and also just not speaking up earlier when they were saying they were going to work with government and work with institutions like the Atlantic Council, which is actually a NATO-funded DC think tank. Facebook is actually working with the Atlantic Council to um, monitor fake news on their network. So fake news is such a vague term that, um, you know, one would think, oh, that just means like tabloid news or actual literal fake news. But no, it seems to be targeted mostly at uh, far left and far right independent media content or conspiratorial leaning independent media. Yeah. And, you know, there's so much to unpack there, Robbie. Um, but going back to sort of um, this amalgamation of government and big corporations taking on a term that's a recent term. You know, we hadn't heard about fake news when CNN was lying to us about weapons of mass destruction. Uh, we're not talking about fake news when every major media outlet out there other than Fox News is promoting Russiagate on a minute by minute basis. And I think it's a sad state of affairs, my friend, when Fox News is having Jason Burmis come to their defense. I have never been a fan of Fox News. You want to talk about fake news? The Bill O'Reilly's of the world that pushed us into war with Iraq with no basis, in fact. That, to me, is and always will be fake news. But there was certainly a different narrative being talked about this summer um, at Bilderberg where fake news and losing the narrative was literally the major topic of conversation. And guess who had more representatives there than anybody? It was, in fact, Google. Uh, go check out Charlie Skelton, uh, who in the past did some stuff for The Guardian, uh, but really broke through this year into some mainstream outlets in the United States. I believe Newsweek actually picked him up this year, and it was a really incredible uh article that he had written it was almost a turning point for me seeing that hey you know this guy who's busted his ass for over a decade came in essentially as a comedian to kind of debunk the importance of this thing and have a laugh is now the leading reporter on it and we talk behind the scenes and i hope he writes a book because he needs to um but again going back to that point 
that's the narrative. And here we are only a couple months later, and they have indeed purged Alex Jones. And they did so in a manner where it was almost in unison. Um, you look at Facebook. Facebook lost uh, basically the entire valuation of McDonald's on the stock market in the midst of people complaining that Alex Jones and even Fox News was a part of their watch platform. And I'm sorry, if I've got to sit there and see promotions for Chris Cuomo and Anderson Cooper, there's no reason that I shouldn't see promotions for Alex Jones and Fox News. And that's not validating any of those platforms. That's simply saying that they all, in some respects, tell the truth sometimes. They're dishonest other times, but I believe they should have a voice. Um, so, we're, I, But on the other end, Robbie, I've heard people try to say that, well, YouTube should be treated like a public utility. And for me, the constitutionalist in me says, no, that is not the answer. More government here is not the answer. As soon as that happens, well, that platform essentially gets broken up and will move somewhere else. Let's be honest. There are already substitutes, and there always have been. For instance, back in the day, Blip TV was around. Vimeo kind of has always been there, but not on such a large scale. You have to remember that YouTube absorbed Google Video before Google bought them. And Google not only made a run, but started to dominate them. People were going to Google Video more and more because everybody had access to longer form content. And as soon as they mer merged into the GooTube, that all changed. And now we have a pretty slick platform that anybody can kind of learn to use and put their information out there. Um, but through demonetization pro um, processes, through instant demonetization on our platform anyway. I mean, every single video We Are Change puts out, as soon as I go live with it, it doesn't matter whether it's Jason Burmis's birthday party with happy puppy dogs, it goes up for review. And, you know, often it does not come back. Anytime that I talk about uh, child abuse content, no way that's going to be monetized. If I talk about 9-11 or bin Laden or even the fact that the Obama administration just a few weeks ago was outed, um, I believe, by the National Review as openly funding al-Qaeda affiliate groups. Uh, I can't talk about that and make a living. Now, I get it. Advertisers might not want to, you know, have their consumers learn the truth. They don't want to popularize that. And that's fine. But I would think that other people would, and there should be a program to opt in for that for for corporations that or small businesses that want their advertisements on things that Jason Burmas puts out, things that Robbie Martin puts out, things that Abby Martin puts out. You know, she's done such important work with Israel. Some of the best stuff out there, some of the most valid stuff, you know, on the Gaza Strip, on the Palestinian plight. And you guys really can't monetize that in this country. There isn't a level playing field. So what is the answer, my man? Well, it's a really good question, Jason. I mean, you know, I, I'm definitely more on the left side of this equation. I mean, I think I, I think that nationalizing them is not the answer. I think the problem is we've essentially allowed these companies to become uh, monopolies. We've allowed them to become too big. And I, I think that that needed to be regulated in that sense a long time ago. Um, what companies like the, just the size of Google, for example, I don't think that should have been allowed to happen in the first place. Um, you know, and the only way to stop that would be through some kind of regulation or breaking the companies apart into separate entities. Um, but so it, the problem is now that we're in this pickle where these companies are this big now, um, I don't really think you can nationalize them. And if you did, um, that would be dangerous also because look at how much data they have. I mean, you'd be not not to say that the NSA doesn't already have access to Google's databases, but if all those companies were just nationalized all of a sudden, then it'd be like, oh, great. Now the government has, you know, all my dick pics instead of just some of them. You know, I mean, so it's just like it's it, it really is not um, the answer, I, I don't think. But I think Matt Taibbi in his article, he actually came to Infowars defense to some degree in a Rolling Stone article when um, when a few anti-fascist rally event and um, Facebook pages were removed through this purge 
that I don't know if you heard about this, but Facebook and the government, I don't know, I don't know who in the government, I think it was like senators made a big deal about this, saying that Russia was trying to meddle in the 2018 elections mm -hmm. and that Facebook discovered 32 pages trying to meddle in the elections that they believed were Russian, so they removed them. But those web pages actually included, those Facebook pages actually included um, organizations and people who were doing rallies at the um, in Portland recently. Mm -hmm. So this just goes to show, you know, that this is something that's happening to the right and the left. Just so using Alex Jones sort of as the canary in the coal mine, like he likes to call himself, is kind of perfect in a way because you'll have very few people from the left actually standing up and defending Infowars, but yet this sets a very dangerous precedent for anybody, for example, who espouses 9-11 truth on the internet. Um, there have been a, there's been an awful lot of smear pieces written not even about Alex Jones, but just about other truthers and other people who raised questions about 9-11 saying, oh, these people are just as bad as Alex Jones, or trying to equate things like um, saying that crisis actors actually didn't, you know, that people didn't die in school shootings to 9-11 truth. Um, so you see this over and over again. So the framework is already there in society for a lot of people to just accept more bannings like this of people including left-wing figures. And we already saw the proper not list that came out in the Washington Post, this mysterious organization called Proper Not, where all the founders remain anonymous, listing out um, over a hundred websites that included over a dozen left anti-imperialist, anti-war websites, including anti-war org and consortium news so uh, and so, i'm sorry i should have mentioned they included them in a list of russian disinformation websites um you know most of them were not obviously but the whole plan is to sort of create this you know this idea that all this stuff is either russian disinformation or fake news um but in terms of the solution of what to do i think that you know we need i mean google needs to basically be broken up at this point I don't think that a company like that, that big with that much power, should have been allowed to exist in the first place. Um, but again, it's our government's fault. I mean, we, you know, they're one of the biggest lobbying groups in D.C. Um, and now they have this enormous amount of power. And now Eric Schmidt's even admitting, no, we don't back page, you know, fake news. We just put it lower in the rankings. Well, that's literally what back paging traditionally means. So Google's already doing this. Um, you know, so eventually are we just not even going to be able to find Infowars and the Google search results? Even just in terms of a, doing a research project on someone like Alex Jones at this point, I was working on a documentary film where I needed to be able to look through video clips of Alex Jones and just, you know, from a selfish point of view, now it's, I can't do that on YouTube. So, I mean, that's, you know, just from a, um, a journalistic point of view, we can't even find, you know, even if you think Alex Jones does nothing but peddle hate speech, now you can't grab his clips on YouTube of him saying hate speech and, and include them because his videos are all gone. Now. So there's a lot of problems with this. Well, you know what, Robbie, uh, on top of that, and you know, I'm not going to try to make this about myself, but literally countless videos I did over the years are completely gone now. Um, because, you know, for those that don't know, you know, I, I worked for Jones for a little under two years. He produced a couple of my films that I wrote and directed. Uh, luckily, they, those movies weren't on his platform because at the time, again, YouTube wasn't allowing long-form content. But let me tell you what was lost. You know, some of the really fun interviews I did, interviews with Bill Burr, interviews with uh, Patrice O'Neill before he died, an interview with Tommy Chong. Uh, That's weird, actually, the Patrice O'Neill one. I found it last night. So there's been sp other people have been mirroring them, but you're right. Most yeah. of that stuff, I'm sorry for interrupting. No, 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 absolutely. Well, you're right. Well, for instance, uh, uh, earlier today I interviewed Isaac Cappy, um, who's, you know, been all over the Internet recently. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to discuss in our, in our talk was Nick Bryant and uh, his book, The Franklin Scandal. Well, many years ago I interviewed Nick Bryant. I thought it was a really important interview. And for those people that didn't read his book, weren't familiar with the content, you know as well as I do, it's a lot easier to get somebody's eyes and ears uh, in a video or podcast format than it is via 
literature. That's just a fact. It's unfortunate, but it's true. And now I can't point people to that interview. So many different things. You know, my viral video that I did with Ashley Jessica um, at the Albany Airport where Stan Lenick ended up getting Sheriff of the Year completely gone. This was very indiscriminate. It wasn't like they pointed to a dozen videos and said, these have to go, this is hate speech, this goes beyond our content. Instead, we're just going to wipe you from the record. And I, I got to be honest, I really doubt that Jones has those all hardlined. I, you know, when I was there, they were on these large tape recorders. They were very hard to capture. Uh, I'm sure they've changed their technology now. But since then, he's got to put out tens of thousands of videos to archive. And a lot, listen, it's not just about Alex Jones, you know, it was about interviews with Paul Craig Roberts, with former heads of the ISI, with Robert Bowman, one of the people behind the Star Wars program in the 80s, with Ray McGovern, who's still doing great work. Y you know, people can sit there and shit on InfoWars all they want, but at the very least, they have brought people out of the mainstream and into thinking for themselves. I don't agree with everything that's been said or pushed there, but I'd like to think that people who are able to kind of find their way out of the mainstream media brainwashing and into this alternative will eventually expand into other people's material, into the Luke Radowskis of the world, into the Robbie Martins of the world, you know, and there are a lot of other great researchers out there you know activist post does some great stuff zero hedge puts out good material uh and the question is when are they next and what are your predictions on that do you see more channels just completely being taken down by these social media giants or do you think that incrementally they're just going to make it tougher and tougher so that people like you and me quit because you know media roots isn't even permitted to promote things on Facebook monetarily. Yeah, and we're and we're relatively small, so they've already flagged us, you know. Um, I mean, even just the fact that Abby worked for Russia Today makes me think, well, why wouldn't these companies already flag her? Because she's a quote unquote Russian propagandist, even though she doesn't work there anymore, you know. So there's all. I mean, it's just such a slippery slope. It's like who knows what actual standards they're using to decide this but i think that it's going to be more like what you said at the end it's going to be it's going to this system is going to squeeze people like you and me into wanting to give up into feeling like all this all this audience that we've built up or all these hits and views that we're getting are now dwindling you know with this sort of mystery black box um s stats or algorithms that we don't know why they're dwindling but they just are all of a sudden you know, I think that it might be more like that to sort of demoralize people like us, because I think Alex Jones is a special case where you could make the argument that he was on occasion, especially in the last two years. And I don't know if you've seen a lot of these clips that I have, Jason, where he's emboldened enough to where he has actually insinuated violence against people. And that's something he didn't used to do. So it's kind of a unique case in that sense where I don't think other people have the cojones and the, and the amount of uh, expensive lawyers like Alex Jones does to, to say some of those things on, on the air. But I don't think that that matters because I think that it is, to me, it's clearly in this larger push to combat fake news. And I think it's dangerous when, you know, you start conflating things like 9-11 truth with hate speech because, you know, it's, it's such an important discussion to still be had so i don't know what's going to happen but i do think that some of the more infowars-esque people um might be in the most danger now when i say infowars-esque in this version current iteration of infowars that's more people who you know constantly talk about q and non and things like that i don't i think it's less so we are changed and people like you um that are going to be affected but i do think the next purge is going to be stuff like, you know, Pete's Gate or QAnon or whatever. It's going to be stuff where most of society can be like, well, that's obviously a ridiculous, so why shouldn't we ban that? You know, and it's going to be like that at first, but then it's it's going to start getting larger and larger, and the terms are going to become vaguer and vaguer. The rules are going to be harder to follow and harder to understand to the point where there'll be actually be a lot 
lot of self-censorship. People making independent content will self-censor what they're putting on or, you know, hoping that it won't get flagged, um, even just for demonetization. So I, I think one of the things that we put ourselves in a dangerous position over is, you know, even if you're just looking at YouTube by itself, I think that we made a big mistake early on in buying into a system that basically, you know, was spending billions of dollars in server space to allow us to upload these long form videos without thinking in the back of our minds, hey, maybe we should all maybe collectively invest in or have someone, you know, invest in some kind of independent media centered, uncensored video hosting system. Um, you know, there's all there's there's some technical problems with that, like, you know, pornography and stuff like that. You know, someone could just upload child porn and ruin the whole thing. But yet there's, you know, there's all these clauses with these companies where they're not responsible for stuff like that. But there, there needs to be a competitor now more than ever. There should have been one years ago for YouTube, you know, or even just hosting your own video on your own server. I know that's expensive. I know it's difficult to do. I mean, it's impossible to do in 1080p video quality like YouTube allows. That's sort of the trick. They've gotten us all to buy into this stuff. But we should be looking at maybe putting out lower quality video content as long as we're able to host it inexpensively off our own servers. And I know that's a very complex and you know it's not something that most people are willing to do, but I think we need to be going back more towards that model. Um, and, and instead of looking at these Silicon Valley companies to get our message out, obviously it was a, it was a trick. I mean, it's becoming very clear that it was not um, something that was actually going to help us in the long term. In fact, it, it, it's actually in some ways set us back um, or gotten us more lazy, perhaps, in promoting our work through other means. Well, for instance, you know, let's look at this past weekend in Portland. Now, in the run up to this uh, Portland situation, the Patriot Prayer Group, all I was reading about was neo-Nazis, white supremacists, you know, hate speech, racist rally. Now, Luke goes out there, and I was unfamiliar that Joey Gibson was actually half Japanese. Uh, on top of that, Dan Dix of Press for Truth and a few other um, independent media outlets, including InfoWars. Now, InfoWars had been banned from live streaming, and because of that, they were going to one of four feeds. One was Dan Dix's feed. Tim Pool was also there. Didn't go to Tim Pool's feed. A guy named Jake Lloyd um, had a pretty popular feed. He was going to that. And then other InfoWars reporters. Well, because, you know, Luke has been in the game, we do have over half a million subscribers. We were number one that day. Uh, we beat everybody. You know, at the peaks, it was over 8,000 watching us live. And at the end of the day, when they started rounding up, I think Jake Lloyd was in second with about 40,000, and we were upwards of 80,000 within an hour or two of all of this ending. As soon as that happened, and it ended, it's demonetized. The small excerpts are demonetized. They're marginalized. You're not seeing them in the algorithm. We're showing a video of, you know, the supposed you know, tolerant group, Antifa, the one that wants equality for everybody. Well, they're the ones that got fired upon by the police with the rubber bullets and the smoke grenades because they're the ones that attacked the police. Uh, there was more color on the right-hand side. Joey Gibson walked through a crowd of Antifa completely nonviolently, and he was verbally and then physically assaulted. He did not react. Our supposed real news media covered none of this. If we're not allotted the platform where we at least can reach people initially, it's going to hurt, I, I mean, freedom of speech and freedom of thought. Essentially, it promotes mind control. It promotes that narrative that the mainstream has lost control of. So, you know, we could sit here and talk about alternative platforms all day. Hey, you know, I've got a pro Dropbox. I think I can get two terabytes on there. I can use that as a server. It's a little clunky. You've got to download the video to watch it. You know, it's very circa, you know, almost like uh, Notella or Morpheus or a peer-to-peer -peer network or a direct download. And that's the problem. You know, I see BitChute out there. I see DTube. I see DLive. I see Steemit. And we're a part of all of that. But like you and I know, Robbie, that's not where the audience is. No matter how popular you've been on other platforms, you're going to garner 
a few hundred to a few thousand views there where with the right video on YouTube, you can have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and sometimes millions of views within hours, and it can change the conversation. And I think that's what's so important about these platforms now just deciding what hate speech is. And let me take it one step further. You know, there are a lot of people that don't seem to care about this issue because they're not politically motivated. Not everybody wants to educate themselves about our government, about, uh, you know, the judicial, the legislative, the executive branch, uh, the fourth estate. They don't want to talk about that thing. They want to talk about the Kardashians and bullshit. I get it. Well, what happens when a large company, let's say Viacom, has a movie out and they now have invested in Google or whatever the top tier video service is and Marty Moviegoers is the best reviewer out there. He's got the most uh, subscribers. Well, Viacom just dumped $200 million into this movie that just sucks. It's terrible. And Marty Moviegoer starts telling the truth, this is a terrible, terrible movie. Well, it's going to get to the point where they might not remove him, but he becomes part of the algorithm where you can't find that video. Or maybe they do remove him and put somebody else in because they own the uh, platform. It, it really sets a terrible precedent on so many levels. Uh, but at the same time, as you said, when you advocate violence and you know, I don't know many examples of when Jones has done this, but I can tell you right now, I was extremely disturbed and upset when he was talking about rounding up people militarily and comparing it to George Washington and saying basically it was okay if Trump did it. Now, to me, that's a bad thing to say, and I want to be able to say that's a bad thing to say and have a platform to do so. Uh, but on the other end of the spectrum, as deplorable as that idea is, I think that he needs that platform to say it as well. Do you agree? Well, I mean, if he's not talking, if he's not making a death threat against a specific person, um, yeah, I mean, even as much as that's a disgusting point of view to take. Um, but I just want to just go back to what you were saying earlier. I mean, Abby and I just did a podcast about the Patriot Prayer Rally, and, you know, I, I have a very different perspective than Luke. Um, and a lot of those people you mentioned, I mean, there there was, you know, I, I don't know which people I would specifically describe as neo-Nazi that were there. But I mean, there's people there wearing T-shirts showing communists being thrown out of helicopters, you know. So if you want to talk about advocating violence, you know, there's definitely a lot of that going on that side, too. But I don't I mean, I've been to protests where the riot police attacked groups like Antifa before. And even if it's just a few you know, Antifa people throwing things at the police. A lot of regular protesters got caught in the crossfire. I mean, somebody who wasn't even Antifa um, got a, I don't know if it was, it wasn't a flashbang, but it was like not a beanbag round, but it was something like that lodged in his helmet. Um, and uh, so, I mean, it's, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 and I, you know, I think that the people who are live streaming who are from the right side of that, you know, point of view should be, have that platform too. I'm, I'm not for deplatforming anybody. I mean, even when it come, came down to Milo on Twitter, I mean, I was, you know, I was one of the only people on my whole feed saying this is probably a bad idea to ban him. So, you know, I'm not a free speech absolutist, so to speak. Um, but I do think, I mean, it's, it's a very dangerous precedent, I think. Um, and I don't think that, you know, first they're going to come for the extreme right, and then they're going to come for the left. I don't think it's going to be like that. I don't think, you know, because, I mean, let's face it. I mean, even if we're just talking about far left content, there's not really, you know, actual far left political content. There's not very many mainstream platforms where that's visible. It's, mo you know, if we're talking about the liberal media, so to speak, that's mostly the neoliberal establishment. So it's, I, I just think we're in for, you know, it's not going to be good, the, the direction this is going. It's just not going to be. And, and we need to empower ourselves off of these social media platforms. I think that's the key. Everybody does as much as they seem like they are, you know, helping us. I mean, there's no, I'm not saying don't use them. I'm just saying don't depend on them. Um, and I think, I think that's, that's going to be the key to surviving through this climate.
No, you know, unfortunately, I think you're correct. Um, we're starting to really look at our email list just in case uh, we do get taken off because then we are going to have to use these alternative platforms and then mass emailing people links to start. Uh, we've already kind of had to do some of that thing, those things with the great uh, demonetization purge so we could make people aware of our Patreon and give them content that they could not get otherwise to try to use that as a form of sponsorship. Uh, I guess in closing, how do we come together, man? That's the big thing. You know, I, I've been talking about this pretty much, you know, throughout my, I guess you could call it a career in this, whether it be the documentary filmmaking, uh, the speaking, the radio, the small videos like this one. Uh, I've never taken a side, and I don't think that we should take a side. I think there's right and wrong. And if you want to get into it about right and left, we can have a discussion about political perspectives. But, you know, just going back to the video we, we put out today where Luke and Tim Poole have a conversation, they started out saying, you know, when we did Occupy Wall Street in 2008, you had Ron Paul Republicans on one side, and you had a lot of left-wing people, you know, uh, Cornell Stewart was there. Man, man, I'm sorry, Cornell West was there. Many other people. Mark Ruffalo w was showing up. And there wasn't this divide. There was this, you know, idea, how do we come together against these elitists that are disempowering us, causing war, and gutting our economy? And I think that those issues are still very valid today, but instead of us coming together in an Occupy-type movement... Everybody has been divided into these sections and finger pointing. And believe me, I think Infowars is completely, I can't stand it, C completely guilty of, of this type of thing. I can't stand it when I hear the term libtard. It's like, dude, that's a human being. You're not going to get anywhere by trying to antagonize them based on their political beliefs. I think some of the ways that um, his reporters handle themselves when having a conversation with somebody, screaming at them, calling them a moron, basically trying to demoralize them instead of saying, all right, well, well what do you believe? And let's have, let's have a chat. Because that's always been me, man. And, and when, you know, when you can't have a talk with somebody, I think that you end up in a situation like Luke was at the end of the day in Portland where this Antifa girl, and we put this out as a short, just starts calling him a European black knight and a fascist. And he's like, I, I don't know what a European black knight is, and why do you think that I'm a fascist? I mean, if anybody knows Luke, uh, it, as far as I'm concerned, he's kind of a pie-in-the-sky anarchist. And I'm certainly no anarchist. I, I understand the need for government, and that's why we had a Constitution and a Bill of Rights and a checks and balance system that really doesn't work anymore because we live in a national security state. If we don't have the government that we set up. We don't have the checks and balances. If we did, we live in a very, very different place. And I understand I rambled there for a little bit, but at the end of the day, how do we do it? How do we return to some civility and bringing both sides together against the true enemy, the 0.0001%, you know, the billionaires and trillionaires that are puppeteering global events? I, I think it's really difficult to, because I mean, I don't mean to sound depressing about this, but I think we are operating in a scorched earth political landscape right now where you have, you know, from the Democrat, sort of the neoliberal side, painting everybody who disagrees with Hillary Clinton and the Democratic platform as Russian propagandists. Um, and then, you know, <laughs> maybe you'll disagree with me on this one, Jason, but... I, I notice a lot of troubling stuff on the right where it's gone beyond Pizzagate and QAnon now to the point where, you know, this I see this idea a lot popping up in comments now where it's like the left are secretly all pedophiles. <laughs> the Democrats are pushing this secret agenda to legalize pedophilia. And I just think when you're operating in an atmosphere like that on both sides of the political spectrum, it's I don't know how you come back from it. I really don't. And I think it's gone far beyond even the stuff, you know, where we really got into this atmosphere. You know, I'm not even going to address sort of the white nationalism, neo-Nazism stuff, because while I do think that's a serious issue um, and it needs to be combated, it's, I, when I'm, what I just described, I think is more, is scorching the, the political landscape even more. Um, and I don't know how, how you come back from it. And, you know, 
you could argue that Alex Jones himself in Infowars actually had a very large influence on the way that this moved. Um, and I'm not saying Alex Jones could have maybe turned it in a more positive direction if he had better morals or character originally, but, you know, it's, I can't, you know, he really drove it in a very dangerous direction, I think, um, especially culminating with just defending everything the current president does. So I, I don't know. I do not know how we go back to solidarity and, you know, trying to fight elites and wars. I don't know how. Because even, I mean, even my association with, you know, some libertarian figures, if I even talk to them on Twitter, um, you know, people will accuse me of being a fascist apologist. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very problematic. Um, you know, even when I see some of the people Luke is associating with, I'm like, you know, that guy does seem kind of fascist to me. So we're our, I mean, you know, and I don't, but I wouldn't call Luke that at, at all. So it's kind of, it, it's a really, I just think it's a really heightened and dangerous atmosphere we're in right now. And I wish I could tell you something more positive, Jason, but I don't know how we reel it back. I really don't. Well, you know, let me let me go back to that uh, idea that now all Democrats are pedophiles because you're not wrong. That is kind of the spin that we've seen from, um, I guess, what, what people are now calling the alt-right, right? right? Uh, you know, these demonic pedophiles, these cold-blooded leftists. Uh, when I heard that, for instance, uh, last week during the InfoWars interview with Isaac Cappy, and he made it about cold-blooded leftists, I'm thinking to myself, brother... You know, we were together in 2009, 2010 when I was pushing for a pedogate type documentary then and you thought it was too dangerous. And the focus was on, you know, 1980s and early 90s Republicans. You know, uh, the, the, uh, the Franklin scandal, you know, that, that was not anything to do with Democrats. That was in the Republican Party and I want to point that out. So, you know, I think we're in trouble when people start making it about cold-blooded leftists or just the Democrats because, again, a lot of these guys on the left and right, they're taking checks from the same people, from the same lobbyists, and that's an issue. And, you know, I don't, and I know you, you've got to go soon, Robbie, and I don't want to kind of convolute this, but I've seen kind of a mainstream push uh, to associate QAnon with Pizzagate or Pedogate. And for me... That's a huge problem because this pedogate thing is something that I have talked about forever and many people have tried to push me into QAnon and it's just something that I've never bought into and I'm not, I don't know whether it's a LARP, or if it's a diso info campaign, if it's a PSYOP, if it's this or that, but I can tell you right now it's not trustworthy and uh, there are a lot of sensational claims that have been made, especially, again, when Alex Jones made the claim that he talked to Q himself. And then, the, like, the next day, whoever's posting is this person says they've never been in contact with the man. Uh, forget about all the times that this, you know, fictional persona has been proved wrong from the Imagination Land indictments to the arrest of John Podesta to promoting a war with Iran. And I think it's very problematic. I mean, I've never seen something take off so much. And now the media wants to push, you know, that... Hollywood and government pedophiles are somehow associated with this. And I, and I know that we have our different opinion on uh, pedogate and whatnot, but we're going to save that one for another time. And I think that the way that we bring, uh, we bring people together, Robbie, is pointing out that reasonable people, people like myself, aren't making it about the left and right. They're making it about the child molesters in power uh, positions, whether that be in Hollywood, whether that be in government, whether that be in uh, corporate America and the world. I think that should be the focus. And I think that that, you know, aside from a thing like 9-11, I'm pretty sure that most people, Robbie, don't like pedophiles. They don't like child abusers. They don't like people that would take advantage of children. So if there's any issue out there, folks, that can bring both sides of the political divide together, I think it's this one. But again, when you convolute it with something that could possibly be fan fiction like QAnon, uh, you're further skirting the issue and you're making it more difficult for people to come together, Robbie. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it just needs to be talked about extremely carefully and factually. I mean, I, I definitely think there have been cases of elite pedophiles 
before. I'm not a subscriber to the larger pedo gay conspiracy idea, but I mean, I, I, I yeah, that's the problem. It's such a it's such a visceral topic. Everyone can get on board with how upsetting it is. That's why I think we need to be so extra careful with talking about it and accusing people of being pedophiles with no evidence. And and I I mean that's kind of where I stand on. It. I mean I was even having this debate with and maybe it was Abby the other day where it was like do we even know that Anthony Weiner is actually a pedophile or has it sort of been built off of the kind you know the illegal things he did sexting a 15 year old you know that's not technically a pedophile but you know you can really insinuate and with all the other stuff out there you can make it seem like this guy was into some really sick shit that he had a you know a massive collection of child porn but we don't necessarily have any evidence of that so I, I think that you know, I just think you need to be really careful about the way it's talked about. But, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think that, um, I just think, you know, we do need more solidarity on certain issues, especially war. Um, but it's, you know, it's difficult when, you know, um, you have all the neocons basically, you know, going, acting like they hate Trump while Trump's trying to start wars. And there's it doesn't really leave much room for... Um, a really strong anti-war message out there but you know i have some hope that that's still a, an important topic to people when you really frame it the right way no i, I agree and you know you just brought up anthony weiner and uh, you know i just like to close it out with hey you look at somebody like dennis hassard way before pedo gate broke never convicted of any kind of child abuse or sexual abuse against children has now basically been labeled a serial pedophile, not basically, been labeled a serial pedophile by a judge in a case where he was paying money to some of his victims so they would not come forward. And these are victims that he was abusing when he was a gym teacher slash wrestling coach. Folks, he made it to the third heartbeat away from the presidency. He made it to the longest standing speaker of the house. Do you think somebody like that stops their activity when they're abusing children as they gain more power or they continue with that type of activity. I'm going to leave it on that. That's food for thought for all sides. You know, this is Jason Burmis. We've had Robbie Martin on from MediaRoots.org. Please go check it out. And folks, as always, be the change you want to see in the world.